Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to those of you joining us virtually and in person here at City Hall. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the presentation and the Q&A session for tonight. So thank you all for joining us, uh, for making time in your evening. Um, with city staff here tonight, we also have our consultant team from Methume. So Sandra Gerges and Brad Barnett are in the audience with us. They're going to be um, helping us with our presentation, and they're available to answer questions. Uh, we also have myself and Scott Guter and Adam Weinstein here at City Hall to answer questions. So we're going to do a quick presentation for you all to give you a little bit of background on the form-based code, and then we're going to start the Q&A session. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So before we start tonight, we wanted to uh, read our land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that the Southern Salish Sea region lies on the unceded and ancestral land of the Coast Salish peoples, the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Puyallup, Skykomish, Snoqualmie, Snohomish, Suquamish, and Tulalip tribes, and the other tribes of the Puget Sound Salish people, and that present-day city of Kirkland is in the traditional heartland of the lake people and the river people. We honor with gratitude the land itself, the first people who have reserved treaty rights and continue to live here since time immemorial and their ancestral heritage. So for tonight's agenda, um, we've already done some staff introductions for you. We can also introduce ourselves individually as we speak. Um, we're gonna go over just a quick uh, couple of instructions about how to participate if you're joining us via the webinar and give you some background on the station area plan, on the form-based code, which is the development standards for the district, and then get right into questions and answers. So for a couple of instructions, if you're joining us virtually, uh, this is just a Zoom meeting format, and so everyone, I believe, is muted right now. Um, if you do have a question once we start that portion of the meeting, please do raise your hand so we can keep track of the order. And um, then when prompted, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. You should have a raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I believe chat is disabled for this, so we'd like to try to get questions um, asked virtually. And we're not monitoring the chat uh, since we're here in City Hall. So um, we are hoping to get your questions um, asked via uh, the hand raise and speaking your questions into the mic. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sandra, who will be taking us through the first portion of the presentation. Thanks, Allison. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sandra Gerges. I'm an urban planner and project manager at Methune. And I'm uh, excited to talk to you all today about the station area plan. So the station area plan was directed by City Council in 2019 to leverage this once in a generation regional BRT transit investment. And it was adopted earlier this year in June of 2022. Uh, the station area plan connects Kirkland regionally, uh, both to the north to Linwood, as well as to the south to Bellevue, and as well with some frequent bus service to SeaTac. So the station area today, as shown on your screen to the right, um, will be leveraged to maximize transit-oriented development and include community benefits, including park amenities, plentiful uh, affordable housing, um, sustainability measures, as well as active transportation improvements. Um, so there's quite a bit of quality of life improvements um, that come along with this project that we're excited to talk to you and reca recap today. So what plans and codes are changing and what parts of Kirkland are included? So the station area plan uh, really talks about the vision and goals, the community benefits strategy, as well as the urban design framework. So that boundary you see in uh, the solid black line, that is the station area plan, as well as the planned action ordinance boundary. In the yellow in the center of your screen, that is, your, that is the adopted phase one boundary. Um, which I can talk about in just a moment here. And where we're going to spend the most of the presentation tonight, most of the time, is in the center of your screen with this dashed line boundary. This is the form-based code um, that we're doing in phase two. So all of your um, feedback, your questions tonight will really help inform the work that you see in the dashed line in the center of your screen. Um, and this diagram here showcases, so things in blue 
um, or work that's been completed or deliverable that's been adopted, like I mentioned, the station area plan, um, the comprehensive plan, and the final supplemental environmental impact statement. These are all items that have been finalized and adopted. Uh, that also included the phase one form-based code. That was the item in yellow in the center of the screen in the previous diagram. Um, and where we're focused tonight and where phase two is focused is the items in orange. These are state phase two station area deliverables. These are kind of implementable actions. And that includes the planned action ordinance, the phase two form-based code, as well as phase two parcel rezones. And so Brad will talk more about that in a moment. So uh, during phase one, there was quite a bit of engagement conducted. There's been over two years of engagement. It's ongoing. We're excited to hear your input and questions tonight. Um, the results of phase one engagement is up here on your screen um, with over 400 survey responses, for example. Um, the station area plan is structured on nine specific topic chapters. Uh, with a high level summary at the beginning and at the heart of the station area plan are our community benefit strategies and the vision and urban design framework. Um, so this urban design framework you can see here is supported by a cohesive urban design strategy. They're used throughout character areas in Kirkland and uh, this urban design framework has really informed the thinking and the structure and the thought around the form based code that we're continuing to work on here in phase two. So these five um, key uh, urban design framework have really helped to inform um, the form-based code. And lastly, I'll, I'll mention that the community benefits really focus on five key points, housing, mobility, parks, schools, and sustainability. And they're really at the heart and the, the, the framework of the station area plan. Um, and we're really proud of the work that was done here. So, I will pass it over to Brad to talk about the form-based code. Great, thanks Sandra. Uh, good to be with you tonight. Um, so we're gonna talk about form-based codes first at a high level, um, uh, and then we'll talk about the phase two work so far. So what are form-based codes? Um, form-based codes are an approach to zoning um, that focuses on the physical form on and the desired outcomes of development. Um, this is, um, contrast with traditional zoning, which tends to focus on land use first. So form-based codes still focus on land use to an extent, but they really emphasize the physical look and feel and outcomes um, of development. Next slide. This is really useful because it helps us do several things as we look to uh, regulations for the station area plan area. Um, first of all, form-based codes because of this emphasis on form, um, it makes it much easier to align the urban design vision that Sandra just mentioned um, with the regulations that we're developing. Um, the second thing that form-based codes help us do is because of the way that they work, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, um, form-based codes help us link together what's happening in the public realm, in the right of way, um, the sidewalks, the streetscape, the public pedestrian experience, they help us link that with private development on parcels and help those things um, talk to each other and create a cohesive experience. Um, and then finally, uh, form-based codes, because of the fact that they're very um, graphic in nature, because they have a lot of um, easy to understand concepts, um, they make regulations that are easier for people to understand both what the regulations say and also what the outcomes would be from those regulations. Next slide. So the, the Northeast 85th Street form-based code um, has three main components, um, regulating districts that regulate the basic design of buildings. So things like the height and the massing, how the facades are designed, setbacks, things like that. The frontage type uh, focuses on the ground floor, uh, on the first um, floor of development, and also on the way that the development of buildings um, greet the public realm, their interface with the street level um, experience. Uh, and then finally, street types focus on the public right of way and private right of way. So the streetscape, the pedestrian realm, um, and some of the mode considerations for how uh, roadways are used. Overlapping those pieces are design guidelines, which are specific to different sub areas within the station area plan. Um, and those focus on more detailed uh, architectural considerations for site planning, um, facade design, building materials and, and lighting and signs. Next slide. 
So all of those different pieces are really important because each of them contributes something different to creating the kinds of places that were identified and recommended in, in the stationary plan vision. So this, this diagram shows with color how each of those different pieces comes together to create the urban experiences that are uh, called for in the stationary plan. You can see that it really takes a mix of all the different elements, regulating districts, frontage types, district-wide standards, and design guidelines all working together to create successful urban places. Next slide. Um, the, so now I'm going to talk about each of the different pieces of, of the form-based code in a bit more detail. So um, the first are the regulating districts. As I mentioned, these really focus on the basic form and shape of buildings and how they can be um, built. Um, this is the regulating plan. It's similar to a, a zoning map, um, and it basically specifies um, what district each parcel um, is zoned for. And then as part of that also specifies the maximum height that would be allowed. Um, and you can see on the bottom left, we have some annotation that explains what you're looking at on the full map. So the number that you see is the maximum height that's allowed. Um, and the color tells you what district you're in. Next slide. So once you've identified what zoning, what regulating district you're in, um, there are a set of development standards that apply to that district. And so, as I mentioned, this is really focused on the physical form of the buildings themselves. So it includes things like for the lot on the left side, you can see it includes the setbacks, um, the maximum lot coverage. Um, and then as we start to look at the buildings itself, um, we start to look at things like the maximum allowed height. In some cases, because of an incentive zoning program that was implemented in, um, in the station area plan, there might be a bonus maximum allowed height. And we can talk more about that if folks have questions. Um, there are also uh, tools that we can use to define the shape of the building. So things like how long facades can be, that's the maximum facade width. That helps us break down these larger walls and um, facades into more human scaled um, uh, patterns. We can also regulate the bulk and perceived size of the building with things like maximum floor plates that specify as the building gets taller that the floor plates get smaller so that you can try to reduce the visual impact of larger buildings. Um, and then there's some other tools like tower separation and upper story setbacks which further define how the, the larger buildings um, should be shaped. Next slide. Another really important part of shaping the design of buildings in the form-based code um, are transitions. These apply um, in certain parts of the district throughout the district, regardless of the regulating district that a parcel sits within. Um, and these transitions are really intended to help negotiate the relationship between areas that are zoned for taller heights and areas where there's more than a 30-foot difference in the adjacent zones allowed height. Um, so, for instance, if one zone is allows up to 75 feet and an adjacent parcel allows for 30 feet, then these transition rules would apply to the 75 foot zoned parcel. And what these transitions do is they establish a set of rules which uh, create an envelope. That's that gold um, outline that you can see. Um, that requires that any buildings uh, fit within that envelope. And what that effectively does is it ensures that neighboring development um, is, is protected from being too encroached upon by the perceived bulk and mass and size of the adjacent buildings. So that's a topic we can come back to if folks have questions about it um, tonight. Street types are another part of the form-based code. Um, street types provide guidance on what the city's in intent is for the public right-of-way and how it should be designed. So they don't provide a one-size-fits-all solution to every single street segment in the, in the study area, but they do provide a sense of what the desired um, right-of-way um, cross-section should be. So they define what the sidewalk width should be, um, what kinds of bike facilities and pedestrian facilities ought to be on that road, and how that relates to um, other aspects of the road design, like landscape and um, travel lanes and things like that. So every street segment in the form-based code area has been coded with a specific street type. Um, and that's really important because the street types also define what kinds of frontages can be built. And so if you look at this example, 
Um, on the right side, you'll see there's a permitted frontage types. And then that list of urban street edge, retail and active use, residential stoop, plaza. And then underneath, you can see it says permitted. Uh, and so that means that on this neighborhood mixed use street, you can... Um, your building can have any of these frontage types. And so what that does is it helps us start to create a relationship between the building's ground floor design and the kinds of street that we expect to be in the future there. Next slide. And so this is uh, the menu of different frontage types that could be uh, constructed on that um, neighborhood mixed use street that I was just alluding to. Uh, and you can see these really reflect a variety of different um, characters, a variety of different elements from entries to landscaping to setbacks to um, relationships to the street. Um, and then at the bottom there, again, you can see that each of these furniture types is allowed on different street types. So, for instance, on a uh, retail and active use Frontage, you can do that on a major thoroughfare, on a main street, or on a neighborhood mixed-use street. Um, on the far right, the private yard, um, you can do a private yard on a neighborhood residential street or on a green mid-block connection. But you couldn't do private yards on a main street because the intent of the main streets is that they're retail-focused and that they're very active pedestrian environments. So it creates that relationship between uh, the design of the ground floor and the relationship to the intended street character. Next slide. This is an example of one of these frontage types. So this is an example of the standards you'd find in the form-based code um, for how to uh, design an uh, urban street edge frontage type. And you can see it includes things that regulate the ground floor design, like the height of the ground floor, the transparency of the facade, um, and also things like the front setbacks and how to include sidewalk cafes or other amenities um, uh, in that frontage. Next slide. The form-based code also includes some additional standards that apply across the district. And so one example is the sustainability standards. Um, these provide a framework for both all new development to provide certain sustainability features, but also ways that development can go above and beyond and really provide aspirational sustainability standards within the incentive zoning framework. Next slide. And then finally, I mentioned design guidelines. This is a tool to help the design review process really target the architectural um, uh, realization of projects. So it gets into more architectural detail, providing guidance about site planning, so streetscape, lighting, screening of trash areas, landscaping, um, and also building design beyond what the form-based code does. So whereas the form-based code will focus on massing and general form, the design guidelines will go further to talk about materiality, about parking garages, about blank walled treatments, and, and things like that. And as you can see on the bottom right, there are different standards or different design guidelines um, for different portions of the study area because there's a lot of diverse neighborhood characters in the study area that we wanted to reflect in those design guidelines. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail now about the phase two districts um, that we talked about at the very beginning. So there are um, five uh, districts in the form-based code. The first one, the commercial mixed use, that red one was adopted in phase one. So we're not really focused on that one for tonight or for this effort now. Um, we're focused on the others, and I'll talk through each of those, um, hitting some of the highlights of, of what they include. So the first are the neighborhood mixed use. Those are the ones in orange on that regulating plan. They're highlighted in black. Um, the neighborhood mixed use district is really intended to provide a mixed use neighborhood with a mix of both commercial development um, and a range of, of different residential development types. Um, it allows for commercial, civic institutional, as well as residential uses. Um, and the heights vary from up to 60 feet at most west of I-405 to up to 150 feet uh, in certain portions east of I-405. And so some of the characteristics of the neighborhood mixed use district standards are um, upper level um, setbacks that help to reduce the perceived scale of the buildings from the street, um, smaller floor area for upper floors to prevent the feel of bulky buildings, um, as I mentioned, there's a bonus height potential so that as buildings get taller, they start contributing more to community benefits that Sandra mentioned earlier. 
Um, and then finally, tools to help us, as I mentioned, break down some of the large walls and facades to create more human-scaled pedestrian experiences along the street. Next slide. Uh, the next district is the neighborhood residential district. Um, so this is those areas in yellow um, that are outlined in black. Um, some of the features of this one are is really focused on, as the name implies, residential development types consistent with missing middle housing scales. So this would include heights up to 30 feet west of I-405 to up to 45 feet in some portions um, of these areas east of I-405. Uh, and some of the features of this uh, of this type include uh, limited maximum height, so as I mentioned, up to 30 to 45 feet in different areas um, to fit the existing neighborhood context. Again, using tools like maximum facade widths to ensure that these match the um, housing character that we see in these neighborhoods today in terms of the size of the buildings. Um, and then also a lower lot coverage allowance. So that helps us both preserve open space through yards um, and also a tree canopy that's existing on site today. Next slide. The Urban Flex District. This is in the Norkirk um, industrial, LIT industrial area. You can see it outlined in black on the west left side of the drawing. Um, this is really intended to build on that industrial character that exists in Norkirk today um, and support more light industrial uses, um, but ones that start to shift towards a more walkable urban character. It allows for commercial, retail, civic, institutional, and on upper floors, it allows for some residential as well. Um, and the maximum heights go up to 45 feet um, in this area. So as I mentioned, some of the features of this, oh, sorry, Sandra, uh, are those limited maximum heights um, to fit the neighborhood context. Um, large floor areas help support those industrial uses that need big open floor plates. Um, and then, as I mentioned, also residentials limited to upper floors so that this district remains primarily commercial um, in nature. And then the last district is the Civic Mixed Use District. Uh, currently, this would only include the Lake Washington High School property. Um, it's really intended to focus on allowing additional uses that are anchored by that civic and institutional use. Um, the maximum heights are up to 75 feet for the northern portion of the site, and then up to 45 feet for the southern portion, which has the high school buildings today. Some of the features of this district are, as I mentioned, the limited height to fit the neighborhood context, large floor areas, which can support those educational um, uses, um, and then upper story setbacks to help ensure that the taller developments in these districts um, are, are appropriately buffered to the street and to neighboring development. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott from the city. All right. Okay, so this portion of the uh, meeting, we're going to open it up to the audience. And uh, as a reminder, I wanted to, to say that there's many ways to contribute comments to this pro uh, project. Uh, tonight being one of those opportunities, uh, we'll have some upcoming uh, meetings. Those, uh, those are uh, listed here in the what, what's next. Uh, the next um, planning commission meeting is this Thursday. Um, the 27th, and we will be talking to the Planning Commission about the form-based code. Um, we also have a website that has a wealth of information about receiving more uh, than you probably could imagine in terms of, of what we offered um, for, for the community to digest, and it'll take you a long time to do that. Um, we also have a other way of staying involved on that website where you can sign up to receive uh, emails about uh, the, the station area. You can email me um, as well. And for upcoming planning co uh, commission meetings, you can um, email the planning commission directly as well. Um, so the way we're going to uh, format this uh, meeting is we're going to take one you know, one uh, question from the Zoom audience, and then we'll stagger that to a question um, from our in-person audience. Um, and so I'd like to open up the questions to the audience members at this point. Do we have people with their hands raised? Okay. So 
I will um, then ask if there's anyone who has questions here at this point. You have a question. You want to come up here? I can. Or, or give the mic. All right. Uh, I'm Gary Nash, and uh, I mainly here today to see what you're doing and also get an idea of timeline. I happen to own the two parcels at the very southwest portion of this rezone. It's my existing office and a, another office next door, which is an old building. Um, the architectural office I'm in, I designed and built four or five years ago under the old code. Uh, I'm currently have a preliminary design on the other site, but I'm throwing that out now because it was based on the existing code. So everything you said makes sense of what's presented. I just need, need to know what and when. Uh, so is there going to be a published uh, document uh, that will give me some guidelines as to what to design, such as height, required parking, setbacks, and all the things that an architect goes through, and then when? Okay. So um, the, we are currently uh, talking with the Planning Commission at this point um, about what to adopt in terms of zoning. Um, and those are going to be discussed uh, at the upcoming meeting and uh, a follow-up uh, meeting in November, followed by a hearing on the draft code with a uh, recommendation that will go to our um, uh, city council, which is tentatively scheduled uh, in January of next year. 23? Um, yes. And at that point in time, we'll have, if adopted, we'll have a, a, a form-based code that you can okay. you can review. So it's the city council will be doing this in January, and if they like everything you've done, they will approve it, and then you'll publish the code? Yeah, it'll be adopted um, at that point, uh, and the city city council will probably make a, a recommendation either to uh, immediately adopt it or provide a, a buffer period of time for right. the adoption. Okay. That tells me when I can get back to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great, great. Hi. Uh, uh, actually, like, uh, I have a question. Because I live very close to the neighborhood, Mix you soon. Uh, if Brad, you can go back to the zoning map, I can show you where I live and I show you my concern. Oh, uh, uh, you know, oh, yeah, perfect. So let me see. Uh, so actually, I live in this area. I just marked. So my concern actually is this part. So currently that we have a kind of like office building in that area, the new neighborhood mixed use area, which is, I think is only 20 feet tall and at least 20 feet away from our property line. But in this new proposal, it seems like the maximum height will be 65 or 75 or something. That is much more higher than the current condition. And also the setback, according to Brad, it seems like it's kind of like a transit transit area that may be 15. It's also less than what we have right now. So, uh, and also, honestly, like, I I am definitely, like, support the city development, but that you have a mixed-use zone and a pure, like, 100% residential zone on a on one block, that somehow make me feel not very comfortable. So I'm not sure if there are any solutions or negotiation for this area. Brad, is this a good time to talk about uh, the transition between the two properties? Sure. Yes. Um, Sandra, could you go to the transition slide? 
So thank you for the, the comment. It's um, an important topic. So as you mentioned, um, and I'll, I'll draw since you started drawing. Um, so as you mentioned, the way that this would work is because the height differential would be more than 30 feet between those two zones that you mentioned, um, there would be a transition applied. And so the way that that would work currently, at least the way that we're currently um, constructing it, is that there would be a 15 foot um, setback uh, landscape buffer uh, from the property line, then the mi neighborhood mixed use development would be able to go up to the adjacent uh, uh, parcel uh, zoned height. So in your case, I think that would be 30 feet. So the building would be able to go up to 30 feet. And then it would have to taper back um, at an angle, uh, 25 degree angle. Um, so the building, so that's an imaginary line, but the building would have to fit within that. Um, and that's intended to ensure that the building doesn't tower over um, any adjacent development. So that, and then it would be able to go up to the maximum height, which would be, I believe it's 65, it might be 75 in that particular area. And that would establish the cap for the, for the development. So that's how it's currently um, uh, set up. There are different ways that we can um, study adjustments to that. So one would be to adjust any of those parameters. So for example, the setback could be greater, um, the landscape buffer. Uh, we could also adjust the angle, um, how steep the angle is um, for the development uh, in that transition. Um, and then we could also, of course, adjust um, the design standards for upper level step back, so forcing the building to pull back further from the property line um, or other tools. So those are some of the things that we're studying and your feedback is really helpful um, as we do that. I don't know if anyone from the city wants to add anything, but that's one of the main tools that we're studying for those situations. Yes, and, and the planning commission is gonna take up um, this topic at the uh, meeting on Thursday as well. Yeah, I think that sounds makes sense. So uh, I'll be waiting for your study, but uh, sorry, let me just point out. So if your diagram is too scale, so you definitely can tell it is not very comfortable look. And also the existing building of that area is definitely less than 30 feet tall. And I couldn't see any possibly changes gonna happen in the next 20, 30 years because it's more like a community. It's not like a single family. So we, we I, I don't think that we can, we say like give a maximum height to say that the neighborhood residential maximum height is 30, 35, because that is not the fact, that is not the truth for the next 20 years. So I think that, I mean, like the neighborhood mixed use next to the neighborhood residential zone, you probably need to rethink about the maximum height based on the current condition, not really just a number. So, but definitely like, like I totally agree that because it's in a study process. So we'll see what we can finally find out. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so do we have, so I'm gonna transition back over to the audience here. If we don't have any questions here, then we'll go to the next question that uh, we have in Zoom. All right, we don't have any more questions here. Do we have any questions in Zoom right now? Okay, well, I do have a question that came up and this might be more for, for staff uh, to, to answer um, as uh, one of the questions that, that came up during our open house session uh, this afternoon was uh, related to parking. Um, the question is that are we sure uh, about the uh, recommended uh, parking requirements um, are low enough? And what? why not uh, consider uh, zero parking requirements? And um, I don't know if we have anyone from staff here that's willing to talk about this, but I know that this was brought up in Staff has made a recommendation for plan, um, for parking standards that are uh, have been adjusted, have been lowered 
to uh, what we have uh, been witnessing and uh, studying with uh, various developments of, of a similar type uh, that have received parking modifications and received ex extensive study. We've also adjusted the heights uh, per uh, state requirements for uh, housing next to uh, um, transit oriented or tr high frequency transit. Um, so those are the recommendations right now. They are definitely not zero, but uh, the Planning Commission is also reviewing parking uh, and zoning um, uh, in, in their study sessions. Yes. Said is that it's green ash. Um, parking requirements have been suggested or established in your planning, which is for what apartments, office buildings, mixed use, and that. So, is that is that something that's published? It's available. Or no? Yes, that's part of the draft uh, recommendations. Have been. That's on the internet. I could find that on the internet. Yes, and we have uh, physical copies here. And, and grab one. Yeah. So. That will. You know, yeah. I, so there is a specific suggested uh, parking requirements for office buildings then? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions yet? No. Okay. So I, one more question, and then I'm going to leave it up to my colleagues over here to come up with some more if we have some more. So um, this question also came up during our open house session, and... Um, it asked why not transi transitional height in zoning from 120th to 124th on the south side of 85th. That would be in the neighborhood residential zone south of the neighborhood mixed use. Um, why is there 150, uh, why have uh, 150 feet and then 25 feet between 120th and 122nd? This is a perfect place for transition heights um, to um, up to uh, to uh, increase those heights uh, down to the cemetery property. Um, as I recall, this uh, this in in terms of what was studied, I wasn't part of phase one, so I'm gonna like probably let Allison take this question in terms of why the heights were set at 25 to 30 feet here. I can, I can start, um, and then maybe, Brad, you can help me answer that. Um, so I think that we were really focusing, as we were looking at the different districts and the different parcels, on focusing the amount of growth that we knew we could mitigate for. And so that did mean focusing a lot of the growth and the increase in heights along that Northeast 85th Street corridor. A lot of the feedback that we heard from um, the fairly early phases of the project suggested people might not be as ready for significant changes as we got further into the lower density residential zones. And so we've been a little bit more hands off in those areas and focused on areas that already allow mixed use that already allowed a little bit taller heights. Um, so that was one of the factors and kind of looking at where we set out to examine making changes in zoning. Um, and Brad, I'm looking at you if you have anything that you want to add to that. I, I think I would only add that one of the, um, one of the things that was suggested for those areas was more missing middle scale housing as a way of, of adding density to the neighborhood in a way that matches the existing character more closely. So not increasing height as much as increasing flexibility for things like duplexes, triplexes, um, those sorts of things in the future. Do we have any other raised hands in the Zoom? Okay. Do we have any questions that staff has for Brad and Sandra? I have, I'm sorry, I don't have a place to raise my hand. I can't find it on my screen. May I comment? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I live in the same community as Yin Lu, who spoke earlier uh, there at the corner of 90th and 124th. If there should be some development, yes, to the west of us, 
would would they be allowed to take out existing trees that are along that border, for example? Well, we do have um, tree regulations that would be applied uh, to this uh, this code, um, and I would imagine that any existing uh, vegetation that was in that 15 foot buffer that could be retained during during construction, that would probably be uh, the place to, to save those trees. Um, if there um, has to be removal, those would be mitigated with plantings and a buffer standards uh, for that existing buffer standards for for planting um, in that area that would that would um, then be allowed to 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 screen the development from um, your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Our our neighborhood there slopes down in a northwesterly direction, which makes it kind of interesting, uh, even for the original uh, developers who put up the buildings, the existing buildings, because they are different heights. Um, my concern about the range of 30 feet to 45 feet there in that neighborhood residential makes me worried that the the 30 would not be respected. It, people would assume it was, it's 45 and we would lose our transition setback opportunities um, for the adjacent property. You know what I'm saying? Yes, it would go... Yeah. 45 versus 65 rather than 30 yeah. uh, and 65. So how do we preserve that, that we qualify or they qualify uh, if they redevelop to do those transitions? Well, um, city staff will make a recommendation for uh, the set height in that zone uh, to be taken to planning commission. Mm -hmm. And planning commission will then uh, deliberate and uh, make a rec recommendation to um, city council on the uh, preferred height for that zone. So my recommendation would be to to participate in the planning commission meeting, provide, or if you're not able to do that, provide written comment to the planning commission so that you will be able to uh, voice your concern about the need for a transition to occur between your property and the property to the um, to the west. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, kind of switch a little bit here. Is there any benefit to have um, to separate the the properties to the west of one twenty fourth, our community, versus the properties to the east of one twenty fourth? I'm trying to look, okay, that would be the 85 to 65, is that what I'm looking at? Oh, right across the street oh, from us. Okay, there. there we go, all right. Yeah. I can't see that bar. That one. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, there are, that could be a condition uh, that we can consider, obviously. There's nothing that can, nothing's here that it says that, you know, we, we couldn't split those up between you know, one side of the street and the other side of the street. Um, that might be an option to consider um, during planning commission, um, this up uh, this upcoming planning commission study sessions. I would think that our community has quite a number of years of life left to it in to terms of the building buildings here, and they are well-maintained. Uh, so, I, I believe it offers a good transition from a more dense uh, area in the neighborhood, the mixed use, uh, to our lesser dense and then cross the street and such into more single family homes. So I think that that has some appeal to it from a community standpoint overall. Okay, so those that was my two cents, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or raised hands? No. 
Ah, do you have a raised hand? Hi everyone, my name is Carlos Castaneda. I'm a resident of the North Kirk area. Uh, I have a question. So I'm looking at the plan and uh, on the far east side of the map, uh, there's an 85 uh, foot um, restriction. Yep, that area. I don't see any transition to the residential areas on the north or south. Uh, all the emphasis is placed uh, along pretty much 124 and to the w west, but I don't I don't see where's the transition. I noticed that there's a residential zone 7.2 on the north, and there's an RM 2.4 and an RM 3.6, but I don't see kind of like a transition from these uh, high scale projects to residential. Is there a reason why it's limited just to that boundary? Brad, do you want to take that question? Sure. Yeah, that's a good, it's a great question. So um, the area that I'm drawing with my cursor there, there would be a transition that would apply there as it's currently set up. Um, it's it's the area where the transitions that's triggering the transition, as you mentioned, is outside of the station area plan boundary. Um, so it's not colored in with a, a color, those parcels, for example, like all of these parcels. Um, but regardless of their inclusion in the form-based code, their zoned height would still trigger a transition based on the differential in height. And so going from 85 feet down to the allowed height there would certainly qualify for a transition. And because of the narrowness of that parcel, um, that transition would have a significant, um, uh, a significant effect on what the building design would look like to make sure it was transitioning with that angle that I was talking about earlier. So it's a good question, and um, there would definitely be a transition. And as Scott mentioned, uh, if you have thoughts on that further, the Planning Commission will be considering that topic um, in their next meeting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I don't know if with this very ambitious plan of just uh, extending the uh, mixed use uh, zones, uh, if the city is considering to add any or re or keep the language of the green areas slash kind of like forest look that Kirkland has had for so many years. I know that uh, many of these projects will require some landscaping, but uh, preserving kind of like uh, existing trees and natural environments, I think it should be a priority instead of like going to a full urban zone that it's kind of like be similar to any other um, any other cities kind of like Bellevue, which like pretty much down on its hardscape, but doesn't have any kind of like essence of um, the PNW. With that, uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carlos. I, I want to respond just a, with a couple of the things that we're trying to use in the form-based code to get at the green space, because we've heard that is such a big priority for so many people in Kirkland. Um, so a couple of the things we're doing is that you know, our, our tree retention code will, will apply here, but then some of the other things that we're, we're doing is um, the form-based code will use what we're calling a green factor which is looking at our existing landscaping standards that we have, but trying to give more weight or credit for functional landscaping. So giving more credit for um, areas of the site that people are giving ample space for tree planting. So weighing heavier, deeper planting boxes um, so that trees can actually mature. We're giving more weight to functional landscaping in terms of pollinator plants or native plants, um, weight for doing things like bioretention. And so that's one of the ways that we're trying to incentivize, kind of not just that we have landscaping, but that we have meaningful landscaping throughout the sites. Um, and it's one of the big opportunities that we see in the station area, because I have to keep reminding myself, one of the earliest analyses we did in the station area that Mathune helped us with was looking at the amount of parcel space in the station area that's currently devoted to surface parking. So this is only parcel area, not including right-of-ways. 
and it's 40%. So almost half of the station area today on parcels is surface parking. So we do think that there's a great opportunity with redevelopment to green, especially east of 85th when we're looking. Um, but then our tree retention code will also favor retention of trees that are larger, that are in areas of the site that aren't going to have building footprint and playing with how we, we kind of treat those buildings in a way that might give them just enough space to make it for those border trees. Um, because we know we have a lot of property boundaries in, in Rose Hill particularly that have great existing tree canopy. So just a few of the ways that we're also trying to think about getting at that. There's other, there's also other um, sections of the code. Thank you for like adding that little green factor um, nuance that I forgot to answer in the last question. But yes, um, but there's also other sections of the code that we'll probably get at, you know, this, that type of um, areas where you're not going to be able to develop based on uh, ge uh, geological hazardous areas, things that are steep slopes that are going to probably keep development away from, from those areas for the most part without, you know, um, uh, touching them or having to mitigate for those areas um, when when development occurs. So that's something else to to think about. Those are our existing codes that we have right now. Do we have any other questions over there? Okay, I ran out of questions for my previous one. Do you have some? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, you cannot answer. You've, you've met your quota already. Why don't you, you gotta get your mic um, back. We're going to name that mic for you. Bird safe glazing standards. Yes. I've never dealt with that before. Um, is that f for any height building or the tall buildings? Uh, or is it made up yet? There have, it Those are. And it says 90% of the glazing. Yeah, that's going to be in the district wide standards, as I recall. Uh, where that where that exists, and it would apply to uh, all development that um, right. is new development in the station area. Yes. So any any design we're working on, we better figure out exactly what has to be done to meet this requirement. Correct. I haven't done that before. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> you don't want to keep it. Hmm? You want to keep it? No. I'm okay. All right. All right. No, we'll go home. Okay. Give me a. Is it, should I throw out a question? Is that Yes, I mean, I think um, I'm Adam Weinstein, the planning and building director. And um, one other question that I think we would have for the group is related to um, ground floor commercial uses. Um, in the district, we're trying to make a district um, that's really walkable, um, that has a lot of services. So you might be able to live in the neighborhood and go um, get a gallon of milk just down the street, or you might be able to um, use some workspace, office space that's close to your home, you might be able to drop clothes off at the laundromat in a really convenient fashion. So we're thinking about a more prescriptive approach to ground floor retail uses, right? Scott um, and Brad have earlier talked about the fact that this is a form-based code. So we're not really focused as much on use as we are on building form, but we still want a mixed use, vibrant neighborhood where you can get services locally. So if folks have feedback on how that ground floor retail space should be designed, you know, space that can hold like a little grocery store or a laundromat or a bike shop, something like that. We, I think we'd be interested in hearing any feedback that you have on that um, or just whether you think that would be a useful thing in the neighborhood, so. Yeah, and again, um, we, there's plenty of time to provide questions um, or comments to um, planning commission or city staff, uh, we have the, of course, um, our, our contact information is on the station area website, um, that is, uh, easily found on our, yeah, thank you, on our city website. Um, you can also, d uh, provide the planning commission, uh, uh, comment directly as they're considering the zoning for, uh, the station area. Um, so we appreciate if you're um, providing uh, 
comments that you provide it in as many ways as you possibly can, um, either directly to staff or planning commission. Um, and uh, during the meetings uh, when, when they occur in these, uh, these dates that you see here, um, you can also you know, follow the station area um, uh, progress through uh, our email listserv. So we'll you know, be sending those out as we're moving forward. But um, if there's, Brad has a comment. Oh, look at. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify um, the gentleman who asked about the bird safe design standards. Um, in the in the current incarnation, it, those only apply for buildings. If the building's less than forty five feet in height, it only applies if the facade is fifty percent or more glazing. Um, so, for a residential building that had traditional windows, for example, on on a wall, um, it likely wouldn't reach that threshold to require the bird safe design for like a residential, like a bungalow, for example, or another traditional um, house or something like that. So. Your, your particular use case may or may not trigger that. It, it really depends on the height of the building first. And if it's less than 45 feet, how much of the wall is glass or glazing, basically. So anyway, just a clarification for you on that. Um, we just have one more person that walked in the room. Do you have any questions that you want to ask? We've exhausted, I think, the virtual questions and the in-person questions. Sorry to put you on the spot as soon as you sat down. That's okay. I'm just, I, I want to learn about the transition into these neighborhood residential areas between the 85, 65, and 150 foot that the supposedly 30-degree angle will help fix if it won't do anything. Okay. Um, we did talk about transitions a little bit, but do we want to go through transitions one more time um, for anyone that might be new virtually um, as well? If you don't mind, maybe Brad walking us through that, and then we'll certainly be around after we wrap the meeting for any specific questions as well. Uh, sure. So transitions are a, a tool that are, it's a district-wide standard. So it applies any on any parcel where the difference between a parcel's maximum zoned height, so what you're allowed to build up to, is more than 30 feet uh, greater than the adjacent parcel's maximum height. So for instance, if you have a parcel next door that's up to, that can go up to 30 feet and your parcel can go up to 60 feet or more, then the 60 foot or more parcel has to do a transition. So what a transition involves is First, the building has to be set back from the property line 15 feet with a landscape buffer. Then the building can go up to that neighbor's parcel maximum height, so 30 feet in the case that I, I just mentioned. Um, at that point, the building has to stay within a plane, which is established, um, an imaginary line drawn at, at 25 degrees. That's what this red box shows that I, I'm drawing over. Um, and then it can go up to the maximum height for the district so, or for the parcel. So in that case, if it was 65 feet, for example, it could go up to 65 feet. Um, and, and the, you look terrible. <laughs> you need a brushing. And the intention of that is um, the intention of that box is to essentially create a, a, a bo a, an envelope in which the, the development has to sort of step back from the adjacent um property that the transition is required for. So that's how they would work. Um, as we've had previous comments about those and whether they're adequate um, or not. And so we're studying different options for them, but that's that's the basic idea. How does that benefit those residential users? Oh, I, I was just wondering how that benefits the residents that would be into the neighborhood there. I'll be specific. I have a place that's zoned 25 to 30 feet, and you put a 150-foot building next to it. Allison Scott, do you want me to cover that, or do one of you want to respond to that? If, if you're able to just respond quickly to that, that would be great. 
Sure. So the intended effect would be that it would force the 150 foot building to be stepped further and further away from from the 25 to 30 foot property, um, such that that building shouldn't have significant impacts on height, on a, sorry, light or air access or, or views. Um, whether it's doing that or not is something that we're still testing through the study and through the discussion with planning commission. But the intent of the transition is that it it effectively creates a buffer between those two developments. So the building might not be allowed to go to 150 feet right next to the property in question, the 25, 30 foot. Um, it might only be able to achieve that 150 foot height right up against 85th, for example, in that particular case. Can I make another comment? So I guess what I'm asking, uh, what I'm seeing then is then you zoned a piece 150 feet you gave him 150 foot zoning and now you're going to regulate him out of that. Um, I mean, I think what we're doing is trying to create a, a balance and then recognizing that the heights could be a little taller up along 85th. So trying to balance where the massing happens. Um, and then I would just say that to Brad's point, these are still open, um, the transitions. We're talking with Planning Commission about them on Thursday, um, so in three days or whatever that is, um, because one of the specific things that Planning Commission asked us about when we talked to them on October 13th about these transitions was wondering if they were adequate enough in areas where there was a more significant height difference. And so one of the things they asked us to take back to them was some different options for transitions. And so we'll be taking a couple of those to them on Thursday and digging into the conversation more. And so I think they'd very much welcome comments and perspective for them to consider as they as they work through it. So I'd encourage you to let them know about the concerns so that we can continue helping them work through it. Yeah, well, I just wondered where the missing middle goes to. Yeah, and we do allow missing middle on all our low density residential parcels. So Accessory dwelling units are allowed throughout the city. Most properties could build two uh, accessory dwelling units, so that'd be at least three units on a parcel. Um, we also allow duplexes and triplexes. Um, those are somewhat density limited, um, so your lot would have to be large enough, but the regulations were loosened up um, to allow more duplexes and triplexes throughout the city. And then we also allow cottage developments throughout the city on low density zoned parcels. And our recent, in 2020, we amended those codes and actually removed uh, the land use process requirement to try to expedite and um, allow more of those and encourage more of those. So the missing middle is allowed throughout the city. Planning Commission and, and the Planning Department continues to be interested in if those are really, the regulations we have are really achieving what we want them to in terms of missing middle housing production in the city. And it seems that, that at this time that the most appropriate scale to look at that might be more of a citywide examination than, than a super targeted examination. And so it's something the Planning Commission has talked about quite a bit. They got an update on the, um, what the change has been throughout the city since the changes to the missing middle housing allowances were made a couple years ago. Um, so we have an, a dashboard that shows that. Um, and one of their takeaways at that time was that it doesn't doesn't seem like they're being used quite as much as we wanted them to be. And so it's one of the questions we'll be asking kind of in the future couple of years, especially with our comp plan update, is are we doing enough on missing middle housing? Well, I see the miss missing middle housing. It's going to show oh, a, it, it seems like I see missing middle pictures and show housing that are like, well, 40 to 65 feet tall, but it shows nowhere around here. And if you go citywide, where else in the city is there 65 to 150 or 250 foot buildings next to a residential area? So I don't know what the citywide helps with this particular area does. Yeah. Hey, Martin. <clears throat> we can have an offline conversation about this, and we I probably did a little bit earlier. But, um, you know, honestly, I think 65-foot buildings are probably on the – probably over what, we're t what we typically consider accommodating of missing middle housing in the city. I mean, I think when we think about missing middle housing in the city, we're thinking about 
something that looks and feels like a single family house, but maybe is a little bit more compact. So um, I think what we're finding in, you know, this sort of pilot period for missing middle housing, which is what Ali, Ali is talking about, is that um, we are actually getting a lot of density on existing single family lots. Like you can really get a lot out of a single family lot under our existing zoning code for missing middle housing. Like as Ali was saying, you can get, basically, if you can build a single family house on a lot, you can build two, a duplex, and then each of those duplex units can have an ADU. So you can actually get four units where otherwise you would just get one unit. So I think what we're finding is that even in these 30-foot districts, missing middle housing is, is adding a lot of density or yielding a lot of density. Um, so again, like might we, might we when we look at um, missing middle housing citywide, might we look at taller building heights so we can get more density in different housing types? Yeah, possibly. That's probably better looked at on a citywide basis than just in the station area plan where there's really limited potential for you know, a lot of additional density, unless you're really thinking about substantial upzoning. So just wanted to add that perspective. Yes. Yeah, Martin was asking whether ADUs are, um, can be made into condos, and the, the, the answer is yes, they can. And people are doing that actually right now in the city. I, I, we know the DADUs were, so. Yeah, uh, attached as well. Thank you. Actually, a little, a little clarification there. The, the attached dwelling units cannot be separated with land, uh, separated. Um, only DADUs can be separated, as I recall. And, but the ownership requirement has been removed from the, um, any accessory dwelling unit, uh, from the principal unit. So you don't have to be owner occupied in order to have an accessory dwelling unit currently as it's written. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Do you, okay. Um, great. So I think given that we seem to have exhausted the virtual and the in-person questions, we're going to wrap. Um, but staff is going to stick around if anyone wants to ask us questions off the mic. Um, and then we'll keep the Zoom room open, too, in case anyone logs on later. Uh, we can catch those uh, on a more personalized basis. So we're going to keep the Zoom room open, but close the meeting. I think we'll be able to shut down the recording. Um, but thank you, folks that came to City Hall. Um, this is I think, the planning and building department's first hybrid meeting. So thank you for being part of our test case. Um, and thanks to those of you. I'm looking at the screen like I can see you there, but I can't. Um, thanks to those of you that joined us online. Um, and we're around. We can put our contact information out there if anyone has any follow-up questions. And again, the next time that we'll be talking about this is with Planning Commission on Thursday. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good evening. Oh, do you have a question? Oh, let's get your question in on... Wait, can we go back, Sandra, to the um, the district map? And then I think we're seeing your desktop. We're seeing your notes, Sandra. Okay. And then Thank you. Yes, so the, the one I was wanting to ask about is the the 150 feet. It's right next to the, the red block on the south. Yes, right there. That's right next to, I think, the 25 to 30 feet. And then if you're looking at single-family homes with that much of a tall building next to it, it's just going to block out pretty much everything. So I don't know what that transition looks like and it's going to look like in the future and if there are any plans for that. Um, yeah, we do have a transition plan. Um, if we could maybe go back to that transition slide, Brad, if you don't mind walking us through that one more time. Um, and feel free to, to, if you want to walk up there so you can see the screen a little closer if you need to, feel free. Sure. Um, thanks for the question. It's a it's a really good 
um, question. So the way that the transitions would work, um, so they, the, the 150 foot height is the maximum height that you could build on that, on that um, parcel, but you're also limited by the transition requirements. So um, the way the transitions would work is that you would start at the property line, you would have to set the building back 15 feet with a landscaped buffer. And as part of that, you would also be encouraged to retain the trees. There's some really beautiful old dug fir trees along that property line, which help with buffering as well. Um, after that 15 foot landscape buffer, you'd be able to go up to the maximum height that's allowed for that adjacent um, uh, parcel. So those 25 to 30 foot um, zones, for example, that would be the maximum height that the building could go to after that 15 feet buffer. At that point, there's a, an imaginary line that you can imagine. It's 25 degrees. Um, and basically that establishes a, a line, an imaginary line that the building can't go beyond. Um, and that's to ensure that the building is stepping away from the 25 to 30 foot zone. Um, and so that would limit that 150 feet to the actual height that you could build within that, that envelope, that red imaginary line I just drew. And then you would hit the 150 feet. So the effect that would have um, is it would basically push the building back from that property line, and then it would force the building to step up uh, from that uh, buffer as it makes its way north towards 85th. So it would result in more of a stepping up than just a, a, an immediate 150 feet next to the property line. Um, as we mentioned earlier, though, we're still studying that. Um, so Planning Commission asked us to look at a few different options. So we're still studying different kinds of transitions. So for instance, you could have that angle be steeper, which would make the building shorter against the property line. Um, you could make the buffer deeper. So the building would have to be set further back from the property line. Um, there are other things we could do beyond those, but those are just some examples of different ways that we can um, calibrate that transition so that it accomplishes the goal, which is to create an effective buffer or transition from those other areas. Okay. Um, Follow-up question. I don't know how much time I have. Yeah, so um, have you guys done any studies to figure out that it is that 25 degree angle enough? It's kind of like seems almost vertical, um, not even 30 degrees that way. And then um, what would it ultimately lead to in a place like where you have the 150 if that kind of transition is asked, then how much can they finally get to? Maybe let's say they get to 60, which is you know still high, but we have this transition. Uh, then wha what's the rationale behind that 150 feet if they can, with this kind of a plan, only get to 60? And on the flip side of it, uh, developer side, does that is that uh, valuable for a developer to take that stepped approach and still have, you know, value come out of it. So, like both sides, does this plan make sense? You know, have you? Is it, into it? Those are really good questions. So, one of the things that we're doing as part of those studies is actually looking at from the ground level what does it look like to apply different angles. So, if you apply twenty five degrees as we currently are. What does that look like? And then what does it look like at other angles or setbacks or things like that? So we are thinking, kind of working backwards too from the outcomes of what would it yield. Um, so that's something that we'll be bringing to planning commission um, to, to evaluate. Um, and as to the sort of why 150 feet, if they can't actually achieve the 150 feet, part of that is because um, architects can be very creative about how they solve for things. and we're trying to balance the flexibility to maximize the opportunity on the site with the mitigation or the sort of preventing um, negative impacts on those adjacent um, properties. And so um, it comes down to a specific site, what can actually be yielded on it, you know, based on how those transitions work out. Um, but that was the rationale when we, when we started down this process. And I don't know if anyone from the city staff wants to add to that about sort of why the 150 feet was was uh, deemed appropriate there, but that was some of the thinking. Yeah, because I think on the opposite side of it, it's like 85 or something, which is which by itself that's quite a bit of a difference between 150 and 185. Yeah, so I, I wanted to understand that 150 
transition plan, how much does it actually show up as, does it make value to the developer? And then really most importantly, how does it transition in terms of lighting, right? That's kind of like one of my biggest concerns is that it's going to really block out all the light and if that 25 degrees is sufficient to, you know, allow for good lighting. Yeah, we did consider light and shadow and things like that. Um, one advantage of that 150 zone is that it is to the north of these properties. So in terms of solar access, um, most of the shadow that it would cast would always be, you know, onto the roadway of of 85th as opposed to south to the to the buildings um, in a neighborhood residential zone. But that is also a part of the study that we're looking at is um, shadow and how the different allowed heights would it would have shadow um, impacts in, in a general in a general sense. Right. But Allison, I don't know if you or Scott want to add anything in terms of the 150 feet or any yes. of the other pieces. Yeah, west. I mean, but also like this is the north. Also west, you have uh, yes. 85 to 50. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So yeah. Uh, so when can we expect you know more studies on this to see like how it looks and ultimately what would be the impact? I can hop in on that, Brad. Um, okay. And so some of the additional options for transitions that Brad mentioned, we're actually talking about with Planning Commission this Thursday. So they had, I think, some of the same questions that we've heard tonight about transitions and if they're adequately mitigating impacts that might be felt from properties that have lower allowed heights. And so we are talking with Planning Commission again about it on Thursday. We anticipate we'll probably talk to them about it again um, at their third study session on the form-based code on November 10th. So that's when we'll be putting out some more information, walking through similar things, but I think we'll have a couple different perspectives to show Planning Commission on Thursday uh, that we didn't have here tonight. Okay, and it also would be great to get, I don't know if they are stakeholders here, developers' perspective on this kind of like a transition plan and how that plays into building something that is of value. Yeah, that's a it's a great comment. So the the couple of things that we've been trying to do along the way are um, we do have our, our consulting team here from Methune, so a firm um, that includes many architects. So we've been using Methune to help us kind of market test some of these things. Um, I know they have several contacts that they've also reached out to. Um, and then the city's also been reaching out to people in the development community. So that includes some individual property owners and my own property in the area that we've been asking for feedback on the draft form-based code that we have. So that includes like in the last week, the school district, um, talking to them about the Lake Washington High School site. Um, and then we recently, and this is just most recently, attended a, a meeting of NIOP, which is, oh, Scott and Adam, you're gonna have to help me with the, it, it's an association of. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, uh, commercial real estate um, association um, it was a subcommittee uh, for East uh, that represents um, developers of, that uh, work on the East side um, in the Seattle metropolitan area. Okay, and they're commercial versus residential. Yeah. How do they know the transition? I think they're. Um, they're There's think they're, there there is a there is a mixture of. Um, commercial uh, commercial and residential. So there's mixed use developers that were part of that subcommittee. Yeah, because I think on the north, it seems like there is like a more of a, yeah, I mean that even just just the 150 part and then also like the transition zones going. As I, I thought the Seattle ones, it seemed like they sort of are gradually transiting, starting from a higher um, high rise, then mid rise, and then a low rise, single family, and so on. So I just wanted to understand why this set was chosen. And I think now we can go ahead and wrap unless there's any last minute questions from the virtual audience. I'm seeing none. Um, so yes, thank you everyone for attending tonight in the different ways. Um, and then again, that planning commission meeting on this coming Thursday is an excellent opportunity to share your thoughts with the planning commission. They also accept written comments if you can't make it there on the evening. 
They'll be talking about it again on November 10th. So those are both great opportunities to speak directly to them. I know they're very interested in what you all have to say and your thoughts. Um, transitions are a big question for them right now as well. So we look forward to those conversations and thank you everyone for being here. And thank you, Brad and Sandra, for your time tonight as well. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>